the other guy was like a little bit older than I was, I think even, but he spotted me like the first day or first week and like yeah. tracked me down. And he said, I heard they hired you, man. Like you got to go to lunch and stuff. So we became like little lunch buddies, you know, like the two old like guys. Is it like in Silicon Valley where Monica is made to be best friends with the new coder? Yeah. Just because she's another woman at the tech company. Well, and, and just like that, I said to him at one point, like, uh, dude, we got to break up. Like we can't, <laughs> we can't be seen as a pair. Like you come over to my desk and then all my, all my colleagues see you and we go, okay, going off to lunch, you know, me and my buddy. Two old guys. And, yeah. The two old guys walking out. Like we can't, it looks worse than either of us alone. We should meet at the restaurant. Let's like leave separately don't, and, and come back separately. Don't get seen. Like it was a clandestine affair or something. Yeah, like yeah. Like we don't want to couple up. Welcome to It Gets Late Early. Today is a big day for me. This is kind of a bit of a bucket list moment for me as a podcaster because this book, the author of this book, uh, Disrupted, Dan Lyons, is here with me today. And this book is kind of, it's kind of like the OG book about being old in tech, which is actually a large part of the reason I, I decided to do this podcast. And this really set me off on the path. So for better or worse, Dan Lyons, thank you for writing this book because this podcast wouldn't probably exist without you. And I'm just really grateful that you said yes. So thank you. Welcome. Oh, gosh, thank you for to having me on. I... I... I'm really always grateful to meet anybody who liked anything I wrote, to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with you about it. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know, Dan wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Disrupted, which is all about joining a tech startup at the ripe old age of 52 and feeling like a fish out of water from the get-go. And he also wrote for the absolute smash hit HBO comedy series, Silicon Valley, which is about Silicon Valley. So uh, Dan is amazing. And everybody who doesn't know about his work, uh, that's on you. You got to go figure that out and, uh, and read the book and watch the series. Yes. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Please do buy buy many copies of the book. But yeah, I've I always that's the thing. I always found tech to be really funny. It seems to me such a great source of comedy. It is. I mean, tech is hysterical. I yeah. mean, which you so rightly point out in the book and, yeah. and throughout Silicon Valley, which is essentially a documentary, as many people have said. It's yeah, people say that. Yeah. So Dan, take us back in time. It's around 2012, and there are all sorts of changes afoot in the media industry, in the journalism world. And you decide after losing your job, which was a tough story to read, by the way, and plenty of us in tech are feeling that these days. There's been a massive... Yeah layoff boom. Uh, but you you lose your job and then you decide to make your way into the tech startup world. Tell me a little bit about that transition. Sure. Uh, right. So, so yeah, I was at Newsweek and y y you could see it was coming. Most of my colleagues had already taken buyouts. I, for whatever reason, hung on and got laid off. And, you know, some of the refugees from Newsweek had ended up at time and I called over there and like, no, we already have tech people. Yeah, you know, sorry. So like no jobs. And, and how long have you been at Newsweek, by the way? Only four years. But then oh. I've been at Forbes for 10 oh, years before that's that. Like a lifetime in tech. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. But, you know, for many of the last years of those jobs, you're always waiting for the next layoff. It's when the internet was starting to really eat away at the business. So, you know, you've been in a dying business for a long time. And um, I had toyed with the idea over the years of switching over and going to work at a tech company because I had covered all these companies and I saw all these people, you know, making a fortune. And I thought, you know, they're, they're not smarter than I am. I mean, the, the you know, the, the PR people and stuff, I was like, I could do that, you know. Um, uh, so I thought, you know, I had actually interviewed over the years for different jobs and um, half-heartedly. Anyway, so this time I said, okay, this is it. I'm uh, I'm going to go and go work in tech, which is what, you know, all old journalists do at a certain point. All my friends have gotten to do that. They're all at tech companies now. They all landed pretty well. Um, and I then I thought, well, where? And so I had connections at different companies and I, uh, you know, went out and interviewed. I had one really great opportunity that I, I wish I had taken, but I didn't. And um, my wife didn't really want to leave Boston. And the problem is there's not a lot of tech in Boston. Um, and then I found a place in Cambridge that 
was hiring and they were startup. And I thought, well, good, I'll go there. This is cool. And, and, you know, it's a startup. So you might get, you know, you're getting on the ground floor on something that's really going to take off is maybe better than going to some big company. That's you know. oh, a lot so, of calculation. Yeah. And also it was just, I wouldn't have to disrupt the family. We could just stay here and I would have this job. And it was, I was going to be writing. So I kind of thought, well, same kind of work and my, my skills will be applicable here. You know, it's a good, because that's the, the challenge you have as a journalist is what, what skills do you really have? Like research, r- reporting and writing. Um, and we tend, however, not to have great, um, we tend to be a little more blunt or a little people, you know, like rude in our, in our business, but with each other, we all get it. You know what I mean? And we kind of like, yeah, we tend to be cynical. We tend to be, you know. It's fun being in a newsroom. I, I kind of miss it. It was great. Yeah, right? It's it's like, it's great if you like it. So you, you have yeah. to kind of tone that down, you know. <laughs> I, and so that's the challenge when you're a journalist at crossing over is, is more that, like the cultural um, behavioral thing. So, but I thought, oh, that'll be a challenge. But, you know, I'm in my mind, I'm still young, you know, like I'm 52, I'm 52, you know, like that's, um, and yeah. So that's how I ended up going to work at a startup. So at that time you weren't particularly concerned about your age getting in the way. I'd never even thought of it. I'd never even thought about my age. Wow. Wow. You were in for an awakening. It sounds like. So To talk about, so you've explained a little bit why you chose the company that you landed at. Uh, makes sense, all of that, very relatable. Tell me what it was like when you walked in the doors that very first day. Take us yeah. back. It's a great scene in the book, right? Um, yes, there is. And I think it's the opening scene in the book, the opening of the intro of the chapter, uh, the first chapter. Um, and actually, I, you know, I sold this and I adapted it as a film script and didn't get, didn't get made, but it was the yeah. same same a- opening of the movie, you know, the poor schlub riding into work. So I, I looking back now, I realize what happens. The two founders hired me. And then, you were early enough that you had founders interviewing you. Well, or, and I was like or- old enough. One of the founders had seen me give a talk once and he liked the talk, you know, yes. and they kind of, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. I also found out later that other people had been through the same thing. The founders hired them, put them in the job I had, and then they all got Oh, it was God. all a train wreck. Over and over, it was a train wreck. And so they, he, they assigned me to the CMO. And I interviewed with the CMO, and it seemed, seemed to go well. Um, but then, uh, so I thought I was reporting to the CMO. I was kind of disappointed. I thought I'd report to the founder. I kind of thought I should be like their advisor, you know? And they were like, no. Um, <laughs> and then like- it turns out the CMO didn't want me either. What? And Great so, so I showed up. Like on Monday morning, you know, bright eye. And yeah, and the woman at the desk is a young woman. I forget her name. She's really funny. I really like, I ended up really liking her. But um, she's like, okay, and I can help you. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. It's my first day. I'm a new employee. She's like, you are? Like, looking at me <laughs> like, what? You know? Because people used to stop me and be like, are you looking for someone? I thought maybe you were someone's parent. I'm like, yeah, it's like, bring your parent to work day. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, was, so I was like, no, 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 I work here. And she's like, you do? I was like, well, it's my first day. And it's like, well, who do you who do you work for? Who's your boss? And I tell her, the CMO, she makes a call. And I'm sitting there now. I'm watching. They have a TED Talks on loop in their little waiting area. <laughs> yeah, so sitting there with my little backpack trying to look like a cool startup guy. And uh, she comes back and says, well, the CMO isn't here. I, okay. I said, oh, there's some other guy I talked to who works for the CMO. Maybe, maybe it's, maybe he's around. Right? <laughs> there she goes. No, cool. no, he's not here either. And I'm like, oh, she's, then I'm thinking like, did I have the wrong week? You know, I look at my calendar, like maybe I'm supposed to start next Monday, you know, like, no, I'm it's pretty sure it says right here, come in Monday. So, uh, this guy, she said, hold on a second. And this, and this guy comes out and he's like, oh, hey, Dan. And he's like, I don't know, a young guy, nice guy, like 23, 24. He had worked at Google briefly for like two years selling ads. And then he was here and he had just started. And I don't know what he did, but I thought maybe he was like the admin for the CMO. You know what I mean? And he said, well, you know, those guys aren't around, but uh, I'm going to take you around, just give you a tour of the place, show you where everything is, okay? Help you get settled in. So I'm thinking, okay, this is like, you know, 
that, you know? Yeah. And uh, so we go around, he's showing me, and it's, you know, increasingly more insane, like the big game room <laughs> and the, the candy wall and the kitchen and this and that, you know, and the whole thing is just crazy. And there's all like motivational sayings everywhere, but I'm kind of like, oh, this is cool. This is starting to be. playing around? Huh? That's my personal favorite. The like, what? Are there instruments laying around? I've seen that at some companies. Oh, too. there was. In fact, we went by one thing and there was like a drum kit and some guitars and stuff and amps. And I see, he's like, yeah, it's just if someone wants to jam for a little bit. And I was like, and I said, well, has anybody, does anybody ever do that? He's like, no, no, but it's there. Cause it's like our culture. I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah, you know, we're fun. Like, okay. You're a fun culture. Okay. I get it. And it's like, yeah, like we do outings where everybody goes and we do go-karts and stuff. Like we have, it's really fun. It's a really fun place. Like, yeah, I get it. Okay. It's, it seems really fun, you know? And then, uh, we go to the, he said, oh, let, let, let's go to a little office. Uh, you know, because everybody worked open style. He had these little meeting rooms, you know. Oh, yeah, and open you had to office. reserve All them. Fancy, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> awful. So uh, he's going to this little tiny room and it's a whiteboard. And he said, "Do you know how the the marketing department is uh, organized?" And I'm like, "No." Um, well, let me show you. So he starts drawing. Like, so we don't really have org charts, but you know, but oh, this is what the org chart would be. And there's this right. and that. Then mm -hmm. over here is this team. Over here is this team. And then there's me. And then you're in here. And I'm like, I'm looking at it, I go, "Holy shit." I said, wait a minute. So do I work for you? Like, are you, are you my boss? And he said, well, we don't really have bosses, but I'm like, oh but you're my boss. He's like, yeah, basically. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I thought you were, I thought you were, you know, I didn't say what I thought, but, and then suddenly I had this like panic attack. He's like, well, let's go show you where you're going to be working. And I'm like, all right. Okay. And, uh, so I'm following him. And now as I'm looking around, I realize they're all children. And I start having this like this acid flashback where I, they, they, they all look like I, in this like LSD way, they look like they were 12 year olds playing dress up. And I was like, oh shit. Oh shit. Like they're kids, what you know? Now this sounds very ageist on my part. And that's what they would say. Is that I was, I was very. It does go both ways. You're correct. Right. And, and, and they, you know, and they would say like, yeah, you just, read us all off because we were only 22 or something and like yeah you know whatever it's, it's just weird right and um so we get to this little room and there's like just they call it the content factory like, i don't know <laughs> 10 or 12 people it's a little tiny thing it used to be like a library and it was just desks lined up like two desks facing two desks facing two desks, you know you know you and i sitting and across the all day making the content making <laughs> the content and, and uh and so i met them all but i can't remember any of their names you know what i mean and like um and he's like well i don't know where we're gonna put you but oh uh, we have this like there's like a spare desk over here and uh we'll get you a laptop and like there's like a bouncy ball chair you know <laughs> like a big orange bouncy ball chair and i'm like hey, dude uh you know i don't know uh can i <laughs> You got any, you know, can I get a, a chair chair, you know, like I, cause I, on the one hand, I don't look like, I don't want to look like I'm old and I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm not cool. But yeah, then hand, like, I'll, awesome. I'll wipe out. If I sit on that thing, I am going to fall, you know, and there's a whole room. They were, I think all women, there might've been one guy, but let's basically. That's, that's guy. a very in tech too. So you must've been in either HR or marketing. So there you are. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to wipe out on the floor in front of all these <laughs> women. And they're just going to laugh their asses off me. And it's day one. I'm just, so they said, we'll get you a chair. So they went and found a real chair. And then like, I don't know, somehow got me a laptop wow. and they're like, okay, so you're all set. And I'm like, well, you know, what do you want me to do? Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Just, uh, who hired you? I'm like, well, you know, like, we're going to well, do this. <laughs> that dude. What did he tell you? What did he tell you you're going to do? I was like, I don't want to tell you, but he told me I was going to be running the blog. And like all these people over here that work on the blog, I think I'm going to be their boss, you know, because the oh founders were like, our blog sucks. We need yeah. someone to come in and fix it. So it's, I kind of thought like, oh, th that's what I'm doing. These people report to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're like, no, no, that's <laughs> not the case. And so, so like really for a while, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And then, I think I went and got a badge, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. went that's down to the candy first wall. Day yeah. What? That's you don't have to do. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, onboarding, there's all this stuff. Oh, no. Then there was two weeks of training or onboarding or a week. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's when they sell the Kool-Aid super hard. Totally. Like horse, horse totally. Yeah. And uh, so that kept me busy for a couple of weeks. But then, like, I still really didn't know. Like, what do I, 
what do I do here? And they're like, and it's, I learned the really bad thing is I've heard people say, well, it's kind of job is going to be kind of like what you make it, you know, you just go, we don't give a lot of direction here. And I was like, we like go getters though. Yeah. And and like, you you know, and it's like, you know, if you need a lot of direction, this isn't a good place for you. And it's like, well, (laughs) a little direction would be good. You know, the slightest bit would be. Like I I was talking on when the book came out and I was doing promo, I went to WGBH, the radio station in Boston for a, interview with the woman who has a show on the radio, Callie Crossley. And and like, she couldn't believe this. And I was like, yeah, I know. I said, but Callie, it would be like, you got hired here and you showed up on the first day and you said, okay, what do I do? And they were like, well, you know, uh, I don't know. Here's a microphone. Uh, I guess, you know, just hang out. We'll figure something out. Like, you know, candy at the candy wall. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, no, you know, you'd say to you, you have the 8 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. slot and your show is about like, no, there was none. So, yeah, like pretty quickly, I knew this was a mistake. That's so brutal. I mean, we all we all have reality, right? That we have to deal with, right? We live in a country that doesn't give us health insurance, so like, right, you need to go get a job. You have a family that you need to provide for, so you're in between a rock and a hard place, right? There's a point in the book when you talk about the overt ageism that is displayed by your CEO at that company, where he literally says on the record, like, "We really want to hire people who are younger, essentially," and yeah. you. And in response, went on your your personal Facebook and you made a post about that. And so that's one thing that I'd love for you to walk the audience through because, you know, a lot of people in tech are feeling that you had just people like the floodgates open and people were like, me too, me too, me too. So I think that's, that's really what this podcast is all about is validating people's experience. So I would love if we could take a bit of this this interview and have you recollect exactly what happened there and kind of walk down, walk down that delightful memory. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm sorry if this is going to be a little scarring for you. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be rough. Like It's like reopening all these things. Well, oddly enough, many, many years later, uh, that experience also led me to write the, the more recent book, uh, you know, shut the F up. Yeah, because I look back on that now and realize, God, I, I just, I should have just said nothing. So to recap, CEO of the company was interviewed in the New York Times and said, in effect, we really only want to hire young people. Um, and the the money quote was like, "Gray hair and experience are really overrated." In yes, tech. in tech. And then I was like, okay, you know what I mean. But uh, then the, they were very aggressive in, in, in PR, and they. Gave, you know, the word came out to the whole company, like 500 people, like we all get to get out there and put this on your social and promote this and drive traffic to this article. <laughs> you like drive an article, drive traffic to an article that says you don't want me at this company. Awesome. Yeah. But like, whatever, you know, they, they, they didn't even think of that. Like it didn't, you know, and it wasn't like, not because you were one of yeah. what like two people there. Two. Maybe? There's like two guys. Yeah. Uh, the other guy was like a little bit older than I was, I think even, but he spotted me like the first day or first week. And like Look. tracked me down. And he said, I heard they hired you, man. Like, you got to go to lunch and stuff. So we became like little lunch buddies, you know, like the two old like guys. In, is it like in Silicon Valley where Monica is made to be best friends with the new coder? Yeah. Just because she's another woman at the tech company. Well, and, and just like that, I said to him at one point, like, uh, dude, we got to break up. Like, we can't, <laughs> we can't be seen as a pair. Like, you come over to my desk. And then all my, all my colleagues see you and we go, okay, going off to lunch, you know, me and my buddy. Two old guys. And yeah. The two old guys walking out, like we can't, it looks worse than either of us alone. Totally so we should worse. meet, we should meet at the restaurant. Let's like leave separately don't, and, and come back separately. Don't get seen. Like it was a clandestine affair or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Like we don't want to couple up. And he was having similar issues like I was, but, and neither of us could really say anything about it. So it was like, we kind of, you know, uh, it was like a support group, but, um, so yeah, there was no, there were no old people. So I didn't think they were afraid. I think the CEO probably didn't even think anyone would care. And in fact, the place was like the average age was 26 and it was really full of young kids. And, and in many ways that made sense. Right. Or some of it, um, I get, I, I could see why. Um, but, uh, so here's the other, so, so having come from the, the, the journalism world, you know, you're a little freer in that world to be kind of irreverent about your own institution or your boss. 
a little bit, you know, <laughs> in the sake, uh, you can be a little obnoxious and <laughs> get away with it. Like I worked at Forbes and they had a, 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 they had a deal for a while where they did a show on Fox and it was called Forbes on Fox and they were all conservative. This is way before MAGA. Like this is like they're sane kind of conservative, like, Good old days. you know, when yeah, it was before, were <laughs> yeah, we really went mad, man. Uh, it was like before even the, what was the one, the tea party. Oh, they were gosh. even before that. Yeah. So like, you know, we would all make fun of it because we're all liberals. We, you know, we, one of my friends was the, the token liberal on the show so they could beat up on somebody every week. And like, you know, we all knew and they knew and we, it was like, fine, we could rip on them, you know? So, but I, so I had a funny joke about, you know, I quoted the CEO and then said, you know, says the CEO of the company where I fucking work. And, uh, <laughs> Of all and you put that on your Facebook. Uh, yeah. And like, and I thought about it for a while. I was like, no, and I deleted it, put it back, delete it. And, you know, looking back now, now being older and wiser and, um, <laughs> you know, more heavily medicated, I think now I would know enough to just say, you know what, walk away. If you yeah. want to do it tomorrow, like come back tomorrow, don't do it now. But instead I hit, I hit, you know, publish or whatever. And I didn't realize I thought it was funny, right? And I had a link to the article too. And I kind of thought it was funny. Like, ha ha, yeah, I guess what? Well, my boat doesn't like me. Like, I know the guy liked me. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, it wasn't a serious rip. I was a little pee, but it was also kind of like, oh, this guy kind of stepped in it here, you know? And uh, you call people out. Like, I kind of figured it would be the kind of thing where the CEO would be like, Dan, I'd be like, hey, come on, man. Come on. What are you talking about? You know? And he'd be like, oh, sorry. He had gray hair. You know what I mean? That's and, the uh, thing. It's like, come on, man. Yeah, like, uh, I, but I, I thought, you know, we'd laugh about it, like, hey, man, that made me feel special. Ha ha ha. <laughs> anyway, but the people that I knew on Facebook all started piling in. And to your point about your podcast, this was the first time I became aware of this, but it was really, really a visceral issue for them. They were all, you know, I guess my age, more or less, you know, a lot of them. And I think all had felt this kind of thing. And really, really, it started getting a lot of comments, you know? And I was like, oh shit, man, this is not good. This is supposed to... And they were really going to town, like making it worse than it was. Cause it was like the guy made a little toss off comment in an interview. He probably wish he hadn't said it because what he said is essentially like illegal. Right. Yeah, yeah it is actually it would be like saying, you know, we really don't like to hire, uh, you know, women because, you know, they, they get pregnant and, uh, you know, they're not as smart as the men, you know, anyway. So, uh, so man, it was the first time, like I said, that I felt the strength of how, how strong the people feel about age bias. And then, then <laughs> it would have, it would have, could have just died right then. But then the head of PR at the company <sighs> weighed in commenting on my post because they would watch everybody's okay. social all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, say, saying, you know, typical blah, 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 blah. I think blah, 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 right? Like, sounded kind of like PR thing, you know, but really like. What? Do you remember the, what it was? Like, no, what I don't remember. What could you something it possibly have been? <laughs> I, 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 I still don't remember. But their, their PR was always sort of very Orwellian, you know, like <laughs> sort of, you know, happy, happy, you know, blah, 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 right? Right. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh shit. So the people at work have seen this, right? Yeah. Like this isn't good. Then the CMO weighed in and said, well, you know, the CEO, I think it's good because you know where he stands. He says what's on his mind, you know? So oh my gosh. At, <laughs> even then, if it's legal, he says what's on his mind. Or just like, even if it's, you know, hurtful or unkind. Anyway, people, then people who are other people are teeing off on these people so bad. It gets really <laughs> ugly and oh, went I on facing page yeah i don't yeah i don't even know how long and i started thinking like i should delete this this is awful like i should delete the original post to make it go away but now it's too late and if i do that it will look like they, and it will look like yeah the internet it'll look like they made me take it down oh, so then i was like i don't know what to do so i found i mean i'll try to make a joke out of it so i found like pictures of myself as a kid like there was one <laughs> I was I was an altar boy when I was a kid and I had a picture like in my little robes going like this. It's a really funny it's and I'm looking very serious, my hair is all combed. And I'm like, you know, in front of the fireplace, 
you know, having this formal picture done is either first, I don't think first communion, we wore robes, but anyway, so I'm wearing these little robes and I'm like, you know, 12 or whatever. And I posted it saying, um, <laughs> yeah, so something about it. something I, I just, I just been hired as, you know, senior director of, of uh, content marketing or something. And I have a lot of good ideas, you know, like this is, we should, be, cause people are like, well, what's next? Are going to hire like teenagers and stuff like, yeah, they're the smartest. You know? So uh, I, I, don't, I can't even remember the jokes. But it was like, yeah, I just applied, you know, my, 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 my new <laughs> So I thought, well, it might as well make it funny, you know? And, uh, and maybe that'll save me, but you know, it didn't really, um, so when I, I went back to work, I went in the next day and like, you know, so everybody's looking at me, they all know, you know, and, uh, Facebook gate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the CEO never said a word to me and someone said to me, yeah, he didn't care. He wasn't bother at all. But the head of PR was like livid, livid. And I had to go make a formal apology like, like a, like a, you know, re-education camp thing. And I had to do it. I had to do it very publicly and tell her that I was sorry. And, and, and the reason was that she was mad because this had been a big coup for her to get this, um, drive traffic to, to get this article in New, New York, York times. Time article. Yeah. Right. And then I had ruined it for her. And, <laughs> and, and then I had like, no, I really drove probably more traffic to that you article know, than anybody else's no post. Such right. It's bad press. Doesn't right? she know? Anyway, she was really mad, like really, really mad and like really hurt. And I had to go, I think I got, I ordered, there were like these cookies, like really nice cookies you could have delivered. I used to get them sometimes when, uh, you know, I, I worked at Ford's for like 10 years and it's like the IT people would come and save me and help my computer. I'd, <laughs> I'd order a box of these things, you know, have them sent to the IT department. Hey guys. And they're always like, Hey man, yeah, it it's like a way to say thanks to somebody, okay. you know, That's and, nice. uh, it's Maybe a little gesture. I have never liked me. I never sent them cookies. Good thing. No. So yeah. I sent her cookies. I think it was cookies or brownies. No, it was brownies. These like really yeah. expensive, really good brownies. And I made a point of, you know, first I had a big thing with her and I talked to her. And I'm really sorry. <laughs> and then, then I made this big gesture, like the brownies are delivered by somebody and she opens them and this is a groveling note for me. And of course, everybody around her sees it and it's like, come have brownies. Dan got me brownies because he's an asshole, you know? <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, it was a very public mea culpa, you know, like, okay, I really fell on my sword big in a big way. And then it was kind of never brought up again. And, and then they hired a new guy in to be my boss. And I said to him, like, couple months later, I said, Hey man, I think I'm pretty screwed at this company because of this thing. He said, Oh no, no, I know about that. Nobody, nobody cares about that at all. Nobody cares about that. But then it was a a year later, but I kind of think I sealed my fate. Although I've thought about it since, like, I think maybe they were never going to keep me for four years. They often would hire people, keep you for a couple of years and then you're out. You know what I mean? They they didn't want me to vest, but uh, I vested a little bit, but yeah. So anyway, they, yeah, I think that was, that was the first time my eyes were open to the idea of, well, that job was the first time I had ever seen uh, anything like that, you know, in terms of age. I, I had come from Newsweek where um, I was, say, 50. John Meacham, the editor, was 39 and won a Pulitzer Prize while we were working there while he's also editing Newsweek. And we we're all like, Jesus, you know. But, it, and then my boss was, uh, my direct boss, the business editor, was a woman who's almost exactly my age. And then, um, you know, I, I was never even aware of age. There were older people, younger people, but it wasn't like, you know, hey, when I was at Forbes, the editor of Forbes was like 90 years old. He had been around forever. Jim Michaels was like a legend. But um, yeah, it just had never... And I just, I had always been in these workplaces. I read in the book that you had just actually published a, an article, not you necessarily, but Newsweek had published an article <sighs> about the, the beached white male or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Male, males in their 40s and 50s plus couldn't find jobs anywhere. So you had yeah. that probably in the back of your mind, right? Totally, uh, totally. And that's where a lot of people are, right? They're in the sort of the midlife collision. I heard that term the other day. Instead of the midlife crisis, which is also a thing, the midlife collision where you have all these responsibilities. You might have personal health struggles. You might have aging parents. You might have young children you're supporting. You need to get help, so on and so forth. 
And so you have to just kind of make it work, right? And so I imagine you've walked into the situation and and I feel like, especially coming from uh, more of a, I guess, a traditional background, you were unlikely to view like a short stint in a tech company as something that was passable or okay, or uh, something that wouldn't be an issue for you moving forward, right? So I imagine you were like, shit, I really effed this up, but I'm here and now I just have to make it happen. So like yeah. talk about that reality. Yeah. Well, also I had, I, I remember thinking like, I, I, this is a great job. I, you know, I can work mm-hmm. another 10, 15 years at this place because this company is going to grow and grow and go. I'll, I'll, this will be my last job. I'll retire from here. I'll work my way up. This is, this company grows, I'll grow and I'll have, you know, it was just so stupid. Like so stupid. But you worked in tech before. I mean, the things you described to me, I mean, just sort of the Montessori like vibe and like the young sort of atmosphere, like that speaks very true to me because I've been in tech for a while now, but that was your first foray into it. And yeah. you unlikely, uh, you were unlikely to probably hear the nitty gritty from your friends who had left the journalism profession and gotten into tech you know, in, in some parts, probably for self-preservation. They're like, yeah, it's great. Never look back. Love it. Right. Like people don't necessarily tell you exactly how they're feeling. <laughs> well, and they did say it was an adjustment. One of them told me like, dude, you'll never do this. Cause even among, even among journalists, I was kind of obnoxious. And <laughs> um, although, you know, one of my friends who's the most obnoxious journalist I ever knew has <laughs> had a fantastic run. And I'm not going to say where, because because we don't want to out this obnoxious. I mean, he's he's term. as outspoken and as whatever as I am, I would say. And he's he's done very very well. He somehow managed to to do it. You know, um, I, I actually is think. Company? Or is huh? he still in journalism? No, he's still working in tech tech company. Okay. Wow. He left um, he left journalism a while ago, and mm-hmm. uh, like all my friends, everybody bailed out. You know, even the ones who were at. Um, decent places i the, all the people from forbes that i worked with are they're all over the tech industry now it's like they're all scattered to the winds you know well it's kind of booming until recently i guess um booms and busts bubbles right booms busts and bubbles yeah and then there was a, there was a period where they were all hiring in-house journalists and they were going to build their own newsrooms that was a little fad for a while um Sounds like something Gavin Belson would do and then like scrub the internet. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is. Like, in fact, it would be something. Hooli would create their own newsroom, hire a bunch of, you know, journalists, like, you know, washed up magazine guys and make them cover their own industry, you know, but and try to present it as like, this is, but we're neutral. We're yeah, not biased. Totally. This isn't sales. You know, we're not just selling stuff. So speaking of Gavin Belson and Hooli, Tell us how you got the call to go work on HBO Silicon Valley, which, by the way, I was able to call it work to rewatch it for the third time in anticipation really? of this interview. Yeah. So I oh, so you can, you can, you can. Like, hey, we, why are you watching Silicon? I'm like, it's work. It's preparation. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. research. Yeah. It's and you, you can expense that. Um, <laughs> yeah. My HBO. Uh, yeah. yeah. That <laughs> month anyway. Perfect. Um <laughs> I I had done this uh, back in the Forbes days and into Newsweek. I had this uh, blog called uh, Fake Steve Jobs or a character called Fake Steve Jobs. And I wrote a blog and I pretended to be Steve Jobs. And um, it was <laughs> it was really funny. And I was anonymous for a long time. So there was a big, which I knew was good marketing. Like everybody would want to know. There'd be a whole thing about like, who is this? Who is this mass yeah. man? And then I finally got caught. And then uh, I I published a book like a, a fake novel, first person novel by fake Steve Jobs. I've got to read that. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. It's called Options. It's, you know, it's not a good oh. book. It got, but I kind of thought like, oh, this is going to get savage. I think one review came out and it was like so brutal. I thought, I, I thought maybe we should cancel a book. Oh, the pre-publication, like one of those places like, oh, I forget what they're called, but the little pre-pub ones are all a little bit earnest and they didn't like it. Or no, there was some, some tech reporter wrote a, a bad review and I was like, oh, I called my wife. I was like, shit, I mean, gonna, this is going to be bad for me. And then, uh, but then others came out and they were like, oh, this is like Jonathan Swift and uh, Voltaire and stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll take that. You know, <laughs> and like NPR, they, I was on, I was on, uh, what's the show with Kai Rizdahl? Is that Marketplace? 
Yes, yeah, so suddenly it got all this. So it got all this good attention. I mean, it didn't sell very well, but um, and then it got attention in Hollywood. And the guy who made Bruno and Borat, it, he read it, and he, I got teamed up with him by a production company. We developed it as a show, and um, we sold it to Epics. And then it lingered for a while and languished. And then it, they, they said, we're not going to make it. No, oh, man. Then, and we had pitched to HBO. And HBO turned us down. Um, Showtime had had made an offer too. We should have gone with them. Anyway, wow. so, because there was a lot of appetite. All the meetings we had, you could tell they had all been trying to find some way to tell a story about Silicon Valley. They're all aware of it, you know, up north. Yeah. There's this stuff going on, but how do we get our oh, teeth into it? So yeah. then Mike Judge sold silicon valley to hbo and <laughs> the agent who sold it was my agent at wme and uh so i wrote to him i was like hey dude you know like if they ever need writers and stuff like can you you know get me in on that and he's like yeah we'll see you know and i totally forgot about it and i went to work at that startup and you know was going along and then one day out of the blue like i got a call from wme from the guy who had been the assistant to my agent the last time I talked to them and now had become an agent. And he was like, yeah, so look, uh, the HBO guy, uh, the guys on that show want to, if they get renewed, would you come work on season two? I said, yeah, sure. Um, and yeah, so that was it basically because my scripts had been floating around out there and, and um, I guess H well, Oh no. Cool. Cause the guy I partnered with Larry Charles, does a lot of stuff at, at HBO. He works on Curb Your Enthusiasm stuff. So, so Larry was out there with these scripts floating around of mine and I think showed them to those guys. Anyway, that's how, that's how it happened. Yeah. So and, when it happened, were you like, okay, this is it. This is my ticket out of here. Like I'm going to have this writing career in Hollywood. Yeah. What, what was that like? Yeah. Again, super naive and stupid <laughs> on my part, but I was, yeah, really, really. I was like ready to move. Again, yeah. my wife's like, we're not moving to LA Los Angeles. Lights. Yeah, yeah, I was all like, oh, this is it, my big break. And, you know, and then I, I had meetings with uh, with my agents. And they were like, yeah, if, look, this is such a good credit. If, if you if you want to move here, we can keep you working forever. And you make, like, mm -hmm. they quoted some numbers. I was like, oh, that sounds good, you know. <laughs> and and what, one guy, they, they, they said a number and, and then the, the, he and the other guy, he said to the other guy, look at his face. Because I was like, <laughs> you know, they were like, oh, you know. And, on there, Dan. I was like, wow, really? And uh, but then, you know, I did the one season. I actually didn't get hired back. The guy, he basically didn't hire back. The entire room got let go. Oh, and no. which is, I think he, that showrunner was his deal. Some shows hire you and then you're in. Other shows just bump the whole room. And Interesting. Why would yeah. they do is that a negotiation tactic? Or no, I think it's like it, well, the guy, the showrunner of that show, really began his career at um, Seinfeld. Seinfeld mm -hmm. always did this. Larry David would hire a bunch of people in, suck them dry for a season, get all the ideas out of them, and then let's get a bunch of fresh mm -hmm. people in with new Sounds ideas. Like back. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was really, um, it was very much like a startup, a TV show, mm -hmm. but then. I didn't get hired back and I was kind of pissed. All of us were. And after then season three, you didn't get hired back. That was after I did season two, didn't get hired Ooh. back. But then when the writing season for season three began, they got stuck and they didn't want to call me like the showrunner was too proud. So they had one of the producers who was like Mike judge's manager, whenever call me out of the blue. And meanwhile, I was working on disrupted the book because I had been, wow. I'd gone through that whole fiasco with the startup that had ended. I sold a book. And he called up and he's like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I think you would come out maybe and work with him. Would that be okay? Like they knew like mm -hmm. you're probably pissed, but whatever. And so, uh, yeah. so I, I said, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, you know, whatever. So disrupt and, sort of solidified your place in the writer's room? No, because that hadn't even come out yet. That was just a oh, manuscript. Well, they didn't know anything about it. And um, and I was, you know, I was always kind of peripheral to there's like 12 people in that show writing, you know? And no one person, well, a couple of people at the top who did all the talking, you know, oh, but like, otherwise the rest of us were all very small contributors, you know? Huh. Yeah. It was, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird job. And it's not actually not a great job to be honest. Really? I know these strike, right. The people are on strike fighting for yeah, this point. It's it's like, you, you know, do you know the guy, what's his name? Joel Stein. He used to write 
the back page of Time magazine every week. He wrote like like these humor columns. Maybe it's every other, but he when I got somehow when I got to LA the first year, someone I knew knew him and said, "Oh, he, he'll go. I'll introduce you. You know, talk to him about because he had done some TV writing." And and I'm all like, "Yeah, this is great. You're writing for TV is so cool, right?" And it we had breakfast. Like- yeah, it does, right? We had a breakfast team. It's like, uh, look, I hate to break it for you. Like, because I'm like, how come you're not doing it anymore? It's like, because honestly, it kind of sucks. <laughs> and I was like, why? Because he's like, it's like, well, you're in the same room around a conference table with the same people every day for, say, 14 weeks. And it's like the longest business meeting of your life. Oh. They bring in, and he said, like, he said, I, his, his metaphor was you're in a first class, you have a first class seat on a plane. And they bring you great food, but the plane never lands. You just keep flying and flying and flying around. You know what I mean? And he said, it's just, it's, if you're used to writing journalism or even books, you know, you write and there's a thing and you have it. It's very ephemeral TV. It's very much like you're just talking, you know? Yeah. Uh, and if it's not your show, if you're the show creator and then you have some, uh, sorry, then you have some creative control. But otherwise, yeah, you're just, just. But I imagine, I imagine you you were quite valuable to them in that you had experience in the startup world, right? Like you could bring things that actually happened or close enough <laughs> to your work and help inform the direction of their show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was very true. Yeah, that that um, and the like fake Steve stuff. The, it's what? Just like a documentary in some cases. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. It, it very much is. And but the, the all the Hooli stuff was really not in the original pilot of that show. Mm-hmm. And it was just it was just about the guys. And then um when they, they went and reshot the pilot because HBO was gonna kill the show, and they added all this Hooli stuff. And the Hooli stuff I think was largely drawn on the stuff I was writing, because my show was about a guy like Steve Jobs or Gavin Belson. My guy had a guru. Yeah. You know, he it was kind of the whole Denpok, thing. You know, was his name Denpok? I, I love that. Character. Yeah, it was so Denpok, good. and and so they sort of created a character, you know, and a and a company over there that was more similar to what I had done, and and yeah, I I was good for plot, like figuring out what would happen next, what would happen next, what would happen next. Um, I was not so good on comedy, even though I thought, oh, I'm really funny. My my fake Steve blog was so funny. But then in the room with these guys, I realized like, no, they're, there's different levels of funny. I mean, and, those guys, are, I mean, and you, comedic geniuses. I mean, that show makes me laugh out loud so much. And there's so many just small nuanced points. Like, for example, the character that got very little airtime, but Jan the man, the Jan the man person in sales, I was like, that is freaking hilarious. The woman who would always say, hi, I'm Jan. I'm Jan. They call me Jan the man before she said anything. <laughs> it's like, that's so brilliant because we do have to bro down or we're going to go down in the words of Ehrlich, right? Oh, that's-, uh, that's a, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I don't know. It's uh and the other thing about that show is that, you know, we'd write it all. Then they do a table read and they rewrite it, whatever. Finally get it to the point and they'd shoot it. But then they would then tell all the actors, let's do all these scenes over, but like improvise. And most of the good stuff in that show wasn't from the writers. It was from the actors. They were all, it was all the really good stuff was improvised. The framework and the outline, the, the, oh, even then in the, in the editing room, they would cut things up. Like I would leave and like, there was episode one, two, three, four, five, six. And then episode five would now, when it aired, would have like, oh, things from three, but then this other thing from six, they would mix it all up. But, um. But yeah, the, the biggest revelation to me was those really those funny actors who are really good improv guys. Yeah. I mean, that show was just, it was exceptional. So it was um, funny. Yeah. It was so hysterical. Um, notably less hysterical though, was a follow-up work that you did to Disrupted. So Disrupted. <laughs> That's a polite way of saying it's boring and depressing. <laughs> I find it to be a very important work yeah. as do countless other reviewers. Yeah. Um, Basically, okay. you excoriate the tech industry in your follow-up book from Disrupted. Disrupted mm. does like, it does the beginning job of it, and you get exposed to things that are really pernicious and and awful. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Labrats like crystallizes it all with data and facts, and really lays bare some of what has made work suck so much. Right. Yeah. So right. tell me, tell me about 
getting through disrupted, which by the way, was a, an international bestseller, a New York times bestseller, right? Like super popular. So that obviously struck a chord with people. It was a revelation into the tech industry, which is, you know, the object of much fascination, but then you followed it up with this really, let's call it a sobering read, Dan. Like it yeah, was that's very polite it was of you. Thank really you. good. It was really good, but it was not as funny because it was so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I should have leaned more on funny and a funny <laughs> and, and a story rather than yeah. And it, actually that book, I the the book original proposal in the pitch was meant to be funny and started getting more serious as I was working on it because I just went into journalist mode. But um yeah, in a nutshell, it was like, okay, here's this funny stuff that happened and disrupted, and I observed it all. Then the next book was, why is that happening? Why do companies treat employees this way? And I traced it back to a business model. And then why does that business model exist? And I ended up tracing it back to, you know, decades of of uh, things getting worse and worse. But um, which is why it's a sobering book. It didn't do very well, that book. Uh, it came out the week of the 2018 midterms when Trump was president. Mm, and nobody, yeah, nobody was buying any books that week, you know? Yeah. And I can't blame it on that, really. But um, <laughs> it just, you know, didn't... Um, Timing does matter, though, I'm sure. Yeah, but I think it does. But it was also, yeah, it was... I think it was a good book. Like, I, I'm, I'm proud was. of what's in it. But it's not a fun read, like you say. And, you know, it was honestly, Dan, I was reading it and I thought, do I really want to contribute to this industry? Am I? Mm. And then, then the way in which it's bled out into other industries and informed the way all industry practices. Yeah. Now, was yeah. like, well, shit, it's unavoidable. Right. <laughs> like I'm kind of screwed. Damned if I do, damned if I don't was kind of the overarching uh, theme and thesis at the end of the day for me. So I was like, okay, well, tech might be this way, but then so is everything else. Now, I guess we're all screwed. We're all in it together. Right. I tried to end with a ray of hope and saying like, I found a bunch of companies that had good cultures. And then I was, and the idea was like, okay, if you want to be like one of those, here's what they do. I sort of studied, I looked at the list of, um, fortune magazine does a list of the best places to work, you know, top places to work. Isn't that pay to play? Is it? I don't know. Or I hope I feel not. Like everything is. Anyway, continue. Give me the way of. And, and, and then over the years, over the because it's it's conducted by this company, independent of Fortune. But um, and over the years, there were like I think twelve companies that had made the list every year for twenty years, something like that. So then I I so I reached out to the company that did the research and um talk to some of these people and, and to find out like, okay, so what do all these companies have in common? Like what, what lessons could you extract from these places that then you could copy? And so I, I tried to extract some lessons from that. Um, and oddly enough, it was, you know, uh, you know, not surprisingly like places where people are happy are places that treat people well in certain ways. Um, but it wasn't, that's the interesting thing. It wasn't beanbag chairs and beer and uh, game rooms and ping pong tables. You know, it really wasn't. It was continuing education, career advancement, mentorship, um, good uh, paternity and maternity leave, paid time off. It was all stuff that people really, oh, childcare. Childcare is a oh, huge God. one. Childcare. Like, yeah. Yes. Like, you know, and um, and then that made me realize, well, yeah, but all that stuff's expensive and ping pong and beer is really cheap. <laughs> cheap. You know what I mean? And it attracts a different kind of person. Right. And then you check out because you turn whatever and you decide, you know, you're going to go have a grown up life. Now you care about child care. You exactly. care about a 401k. Yep. You, know, you care about health benefits. The things that were sexy to you when you were young are not the same things that are sexy to you when you are old. Yeah. Like I never played ping pong at that startup. I was only there almost two years. I never played ping pong. I never played pool video games. I don't think I ever played any of the games. Did you go to the candy wall? I did a couple of times, but you know, it's like, you know, I, I can't really eat a lot of candy. That's the other know? thing. It's like, well, we're going to put on weight at our, yeah, at our yeah. fan stage if we just, yeah, get it's up like, yeah, I, I'll have diabetes if I work. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I can't, I can't wanna, really hit the candy well. And burnout. Let's not get yeah. diabetes while yeah, we're it's at like, it. look at me, man. You think I, I can't eat candy, but, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was cool. But, um, and I, I, I always add this, um, sort of asterisks that 
most people there were really having a great time. Like a lot of people there were having a really, really great time and have fantastic memories. And then there were some people who would get chewed up and like you didn't fit. You yeah. get, you know. Culture fit, right? Yeah, culture fit. And, and I ended up after my book came out, all oh, these people came out of the woodwork to tell me their stories at the same place. And they oh. were crazy, insane stories. And, oh, wow. um, and that's what, yeah. So that led me to write Lab Rats because I, I realized also there was a new kind of suffering at work that wasn't, you know, oh, the, the work is so hard, the hours are long, or my boss is a jerk. Um, it was more like this psychological uh, suffering. And people left these places with their self-esteem in tatters. Yeah. Um, they were really destroyed. Yeah. Like um, they really left feeling like I am really no good. I thought I was good, but I'm not good. And over and over, I heard people tell me that. It was very sad. And that's right. I, I just am recalling in your book that you had one such experience where you had a really extremely toxic boss who tried to make your life hell in an attempt to make you flee the company, which ultimately I did. But yeah, I mean, this happens everywhere. It's so relatable. Yeah, it was a weird experience because I had heard of that tactic. Like it didn't happen in journalism. People very rarely got fired. Well, graduated, right? Yeah, they call it graduated, and they were all happy for you, and they put in an email, oh, you know, so-and-so graduated, we can't wait to see what they're going to do next. And when <laughs> they'd say that, you know, they didn't have anything next, which meant they were fired, right? Because oh, if, right. you know, yeah. someone's, if, if someone left it for a job, they'd be like, well, he's got a job at Google, and we're so happy for him. But this was just like, can't wait to see. And oh, you would get fired, you would graduate, like you get Wednesday night at the oh, Wednesday after the end of the day, or whatever. Or they just tell you, don't come tomorrow. Oh, boy. Like, it's just done. Bye. Like, out of the blue, people get kneecapped all the time. And um, yeah, and it and was it's a like lot. safety in that kind of an environment when it could be like your name any day, right? Like your head. Right. And then, and then it's like you see it happening all the time. And then you're the survivors, right? And you're kind of like, oh, God. Yeah, it creates mm -hmm. this feel like it, it could happen to any of us. And so um, But it, I think some people didn't feel that because they felt so much part of like the in group yes like you didn't really have to be good you just had to be that's right there was something you called it something in the book it was like the boss um it was basically like failing up like when you get in early enough at a tech company you can continually be promoted into into roles you should have no access to whatsoever and i think it was something that maybe steve jobs coined it I, yeah the, the bozo explosion oh, that's it yes the bozo explosion and so you're surrounded by these people where you're like him he has that job like what like how right and that i've seen over and over again in my career too have you like where people oh yeah if you're popular it's like high school but like you're oh, popular sure. and so everybody likes you a hundred percent. That is, yeah? that is very much in play for sure. Really? Mm -hmm. You've experienced that? Absolutely. Did you ever feel like you were the outside one? Uh, sadly, I, well, yes, always. I was never the bozo getting uh, pushed up the, uh, up the rungs of the ladder. Unfortunately, I would have loved to be. I'm like, Hey, if, if this is how it goes, if you fail up, like pick me, why not me? I'm, I'm in, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I'll maybe even do well. And continue going up for you. But yeah, no, I saw, I saw it pretty much everywhere. A lot of it seemed to have to do with enthusiasm. You know? Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which by the way, we aren't, we aren't suggested to have as much of that as we get older. Right. Um, I actually had someone interview me recently and ask me like, how do you, how do you keep your energy up? How, how do you know, how do you stay energetic? And I was like, wait, I'm not sure if this is a coded way of saying you are old or like if you're actually thinking I'm low energy or something, it was very awkward, but I can only imagine it's going to get 10 times worse as I get older. You say Adderall, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You say Adderall. how do you do it? I don't know. That's what, what I do. I start every day with vitamin A. That's you know? amazing. Yeah. Tell and them so that. Yeah. So well, there's they, a shortage, Dan, there's a shortage. I can't and, get the meds I actually need. <laughs> and you didn't, oh, that's right. I heard those meds are in short, short supply. Yep, um, and then, you didn't get that job or do you haven't heard yet? Or what? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, that was actually a job that I held in the past. But I remember during the interview process, that question was asked to me and I was like, mm. and, and the guy who asked it was older than I am at, by a lot. And I was like, what's this? I don't know. 
Yeah. Maybe it was because I'd mentioned I had kids, which by the way, I don't advise a lot of people to do unless it's somehow coming up on the interviewer's part and you're creating rapport. Otherwise I'm like, it only seeks to, to hurt me as a woman. So as a man, they're probably like, the promotion. You're a dad. You're such a good dad. You got your wife at home, right? She's, she's taking kids, right? You know, yeah, just, yeah. That's still in play very much. Have you seen that video went viral recently on like TikTok with this UPS driver talking about his wife? He, he was no. It's it's a twist where um, he starts off by saying, you know, I don't help my wife with the cooking, I don't help with the cleaning, I don't help raise the kids, and he's thinking, okay. This, and then he turns around, and he says, because those are my jobs, like I do those things too. I'm not helping her, like I'm a man, and like. This is like, stop getting over this idea that you help your wife with that stuff. Like, no, step up. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But yeah, I think, well, there also, I heard stories of women getting pregnant and then suddenly, you know, oh, there's some performance problem and you're gone. It's interesting how that occurs in relation to, yeah, in proximity to the pregnancy. But Mm -hmm. I think there are other companies that are really great, that really, uh, really uh, treat people really well. Hope. (laughs) <laughs> What's, yeah well you know I, yeah and it's it is it does come down to the culture and i think the culture starts with the founders and yeah um and i've noticed that another i don't know if you ever have like are your kids in school yes i forget how old they are like six and eight are your mm-hmm. kids yeah kids are in school elementary so yeah elementary is a little too early my kids went went to a a, a, a private middle school and transferred there and uh they had this culture you know and it was like it was really good it was just i i really admired the culture of the school and i would, was wondering how do they do this because you know it's every year it's a new group of kids but i realized a lot of it had to do with the headmaster who had come in yeah. Yeah. and it set this example of of what you know how we operate and what we do and um yeah i think a lot of it Culture is fascinating to me, but um, I think a lot of it stems from leadership and from people people who are leaders who are um, walking the walk, so to speak, yeah. who, are, who are acting, you know, setting an example. But, so but, you but you're young to feel like old about the workplace, <laughs> I think, aren't you? I mean, you know. I'm, I'm 40, 41 next week. Wow, but- you're so brave to say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to change things, right? Like we should all be proud of our age. You're 41 I'm, next week. 41 next week. Oh, happy birthday! Thank you. What day is it? October uh, what? The 24th. Okay. Uh, big horoscope guy over there. What's that? Are you a big horoscope guy? <laughs> no, I, I was. I don't know what 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 horoscope is that. Um, I'm. I thought that's where you're going to go with this. But no, I'm I don't a, know those. I'm things. Husper. I'm a Libra and a Scorpio. Both. <laughs> so. Yeah. I know, <laughs> I know just enough of that to know that like you should avoid Scorpios at all costs, <laughs> right? Right? Isn't that isn't that the case? I I, a little bit I dated I, I more than dated. I was madly in love with a liberal the woman who was a Scorpio when I was young. Yeah, um, she was. Um, I guess you dodged a bullet. What can I say? <laughs> you know, we're still friends. We talk all the time. We had one of those like crazy toxic relationships. That's oh, also, oof. but also like. Uh, and yeah. 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 No, probably good that that one ended. See, I'm think, I'm uh, also a Libra. Yeah. I identify as Libra. So what, is, I, what are Libras like? Libras are the water signs. So we're very loving and open and kind, et cetera. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You know, the one that freaks me out more than the horoscope stuff. And it came, I don't know how old this stuff is, is the, what's your love language? Oh, Do you God. know that stuff? I read that book forever ago. You did? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. I don't remember yeah. thing from it. I was like, I think I like all of these things. It was like, which one? Which one do you like? It was like, you like gifts? You like words of affirmation? Do you like physical contact? I was like, all yeah. of them. Check, check, like, check. Yeah, yeah. I'll take all of that. I'll that all sounds all. good. Yeah, I, I, I for a while, I don't know. Yeah, it must have been. A, it was a, that's an old thing, right? I remember meeting people or talking to people, and they'd be like, "Oh, have you heard about love language? Like, What's your love language?" <laughs> You know, now it's, a, uh, now it's a quiz to get your email, right? It's like find out which you know variety of coffee oh, you are, or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but uh, my son and I just started watching this this documentary last night. It's a series about this, I guess it was a cult called Twin Flames. Have you heard of this? 
Oh my God. I've, I've heard of the concept of twin flames. Tell me more. I, I'm, oh. I, I guess I, I'm going to get sucked in though. I'm, oh boy, maybe my, my son's taking a course in uh, college freshman year about cults and uh, fascinating. Yeah. And then somehow he's home because he's sick. And uh, uh, we were buzzing through the channels last night and I saw something about twin flames because he and I kind of like cult things or, you know, weird, like unexplained mysteries, kind of UFO things. You know, we watch all those things because they're just crazy, you know? Plenty and, of that. Uh, really? He's like, oh, dad, yeah, I've heard of twin flames. You got to watch this. So we checked it out and it was like this couple, right? And they had this idea, the twin flame idea is that everybody out there has someone who is not like your soulmate. It's even more than a soulmate. It's like you're half of it and they're the other half and you just have to find each other. And it's like divinely inspired. And um, yeah. so it began well, as kind of like self, now. it became like self-help run by this couple. Only they became almost like cult leaders and yeah, it got very culty. Multimillionaires, I'm sure. Yeah, they made a fortune. and. I only watched the first episode last night, so I'm dying to see where it goes. But I love that concept too, that you have a twin flame. And it was like all these, you, just in the first episode, you start to see where it's going wrong, where people are like, well, you know, this guy, I really like him. He comes into the store, but, you know, I haven't talked to him yet, but I'm pretty sure he's my twin flame. They're like, they're like he is your twin flame. And you have to take action, right? But then they would be like, uh, this guy... This guy blocked me on Facebook and, <laughs> and they're like, you have to go to his house, knock on his door because you what? love him and you oh, know, and he loves it. you. He oh, loves you. He just needs you to act. So they had to turn people into stalkers. That is horrendous. It's so That's funny. Awful. It's great, man. It's great. I don't wow. know why we're talking about this, but anyway, well, you're going to edit all this out, right? I'm looking, I think everyone's looking for their twin flame employer version. So. <gasps> wow. Look at how you brought that back. You, you like are that? good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Reading the needle. So yeah. you've learned a lot about the tech industry through living in it, um, working first at that company that shall go unnamed unless you go purchase the book, Disrupted, which everyone should go do, obviously. Uh, but after that, you you continued your work in the tech industry. You also got to parody it on the fantastic show, HBO Silicon Valley, which is hysterical. And if people on the sh people listening to the show haven't watched that, that's like, I mean, come on, guys. Let's let's go. Then you got into the sobering analysis of Silicon Valley and the tech industry at large with Lab Rats. And now you are working at DocuSign, which I would imagine has to be somewhat of a twin flame for you because you are there and you've been there a while and you seem happy. So tell us, as you've gotten older, as you've gotten more experience, what, 10 plus years in the tech industry, what should people be looking out for to find their twin flame employer? Wow. That's such a good question. And we should start a twin flame cult around employing, like, like basically headhunting, recruiting. Yes. Twin flame. I love right? it. Because that was the premise twin of the cult was we'll business. help you find, we're going to help you find your twin flame. Um, Brilliant. But the I would say. Here today, Dan, we started it. Our little we startup. This, we should record. Well, we are recording this, so we'll yeah, know perfect. the origin story of this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we probably do better finding jobs for other people. Then. <laughs> How about for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. We should both get. I love my job. I exactly. love where I work, and I, uh, for the first time since I think I was at Newsweek, like I wake up every day and just like psyched to. I my work at home, but like psyched to go to work. I am. I just yeah. I somehow got really lucky, and the uh, DocuSign has this amazing culture. It's one of the things that nobody. And it's like twenty years old, so it's not a startup. And, um, it's uh, that culture has baked in that it's that people, people always say, everyone who works there will say, what, the, what do you like best? It's like, I, I love the people. I just, I work with great people. And, um, and right now the company's in this period of transition. They, the entire, right after I joined the entire leadership team basically turned over. So it's almost like a whole new company or it's a new team with a new vision for this very cool established company. Like, how are we going to build this next act for the company? So if you're, if you like that, some people I think want to be in a place that's, um, you know, it's all, you just, you fit in and do the role because someone else used to have this job and now you have it or yeah, or you can in a role in this place, you know, there's a little bit of not chaos, but there's a lot of change, you know what I mean? And if you see that as an opportunity, 
which I do, then it's a great place to be. But yeah, it's like, honestly, it's really, really fun. And I get to do stuff that's a lot like journalism. And uh, yeah, so it's it's crazy. It kind of has my twin flame. And uh, <laughs> Docu-Sign and Dan Lyons. <laughs> it kind of is. And not not every, you know, there's, there's people of all ages. And, uh, and Are you guys and, hiring? Huh? <laughs> you guys hiring? Just saying. Uh, they might be. We'll talk. We'll talk out. I, I, I'm so probably... Funny. But, you know, they, they really, honestly, like, um, I've met, we had a meet and greet in Boston for whoever wanted to come, go out for drinks. And like, they're all, you know, people in sales and so nobody, nobody's in comms. Like I'm in communications, but it's a very small group. But these, even these people were all great. I was like, I want to hang out with you guys all the time. Like they're just, That's awesome. they've all been around a bit, you know, they're kind of yeah. veterans and they, uh, yeah. Anyway, so it's, yeah, That's this is my twin flame job. But how would you go about <laughs> finding your twin flame job? I guess first you'd have well, to know. Let's give what... some people some hope because you know what? We're all getting older every passing minute, right? And most of us can't, you know, be independently wealthy. So we kind of need to have jobs. And stuff. I wish so, I could be. Show us the way, Dan. Like, give us some hope. Well, don't you think? I think, first of all, so the big thing about twin flames, I would, this, we're going to beat this metaphor to death, but it is commitment, right? And it's yeah. like you don't have a twin flame that you're going to be twin flames for 18 months, right? And then you're going to go find the next twin flame, right? And so I think, I'm not sure if, you know, employment for life, well, we're never going back to that. And I'm not even sure that was great, but that's like my dad's generation. My dad worked at one company his whole career, retired, pension, blah, blah. Um, but I do think, and it ties back to that, like best places to work thing. When an employer conveys that there's a commitment to stay with you and to, uh, help you grow and to provide you with things that make your life good. Uh, it brings out the best in people. Um, and it creates, like you said, mentioned psychological safety, uh, that sense of, of, no, you belong here. And, um, I think, you know, that would be, I think that would be even an interpersonal relationship. You'd need that to be called a twin flame. Like what do they call it? Harmonious twin flame union. They have like all these terms, but like, yeah. And that's, but like, basically it has to come down to people on both sides have to be like, you know, I'm going to commit to you, the company, I'm going to really, you know, do a lot. And the company says, yeah, good. And we're going to commit to you. Right. So, I mean, I always wondered, like the thing at that startup was like, we want you to be completely devoted to us. We want you to wear swag every day to work. The company color was orange. So people would buy orange sneakers and orange watches and orange. This, and, but, but we, we don't have any commitment to you. Like right. you should have it was very disjointed on, you know, yeah. Way poorly. Yeah. But, I, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think, um, yeah, twin flame employers. That's a really good idea. Man. Like, <laughs> I'm really kind of stuck with that now. I think I'm going to have a hard time getting that out of my head. That was a great idea. Seriously. <laughs> it, it is. is it. You're like, hey, it's what I do. So, you know, I come, I'm gonna I come up with great ideas. Yeah, I'm going to have like five more before this day is over. That's just not even one of the good ones. But, <laughs> I'm all about innovation and disrupting. Okay. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking things, Stan. That's what I'm You for. like to foster collaboration and optimize all performance. All of uh, those I was reading somebody's uh, LinkedIn bio. That's another story. But, but yeah, oh, you know, wow. that, that is, that is a good metaphor though. I and mean, people kind of have to find, because here's the other thing, we the place want. where, well, th there's another fit that says like, if it is a place where you're going to bounce in for 18 months, two years, there's yeah. a lot of people who want to do that too. Like so that's their twin flame, right? Yeah. And you know what? Like I will say in defense of people who do that, um, one of the best things about, and I unintentionally did that. I mean, it was not the point. <laughs> it wasn't it. your choice. Not my choice necessarily. In some yeah. things it was. The more recent ones, not so much. Um, the <laughs> We will not get into the reasons I've okay. been leaving certain places and why one such company will literally never go on my resume because I'm so horrified by what went down at this company. Really? Uh, oh, oh man. The things I could tell you. I'm going to put it in a book. I'm. It's It's so bad horrendous absolutely wow. okay um yeah like so bad you need to see the receipts to believe it like crazy um in 2023 crazy crazy shit still happens like emily chang's book brotopia mm -hmm. I'm yeah. still happening um oh i believe that. Yeah. Like, what i can say about having moved around is i've amassed this amazing network of 
awesome friends and people mm -hmm. that I can call tomorrow and just pick right back up where we left off. And yeah, so yeah. from that perspective, it's been great and it's been broadening my horizons and you know and my network. Um, yeah. I'm not thinking of it in like a transactional way, but like I have all of these friends. And actually, when you're looking for your twin flame employer, what you should be doing is actually connecting with people from your network. So by virtue of having jumped around a bit, I do have a bigger lay of land, right? I have a little bit more of a shot there, but you know, I'm just looking for a home, Dan. I'm looking for the right place um, or no place at all and doing this thing and somehow making it work. But it's, um, you know, I think people, a lot of people don't prefer the concept of having to, you know, have these tours of duty, basically gig working in a yeah. setting. Like not, not many people are super pumped about that. So um pumped by the way. Oh, you should watch if you haven't seen the super pumped about uh, Uber. I haven't seen that show. Is it good? Oh, it's so good, but it makes really? you, it's kind of yeah. like lab rats, you know, it just makes yeah. you want to just dystopian ugh, F out, you know, is it on but, HBO? I'll find it. I, don't know I think it's on Showtime. Showtime. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's really good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I thought that show didn't do very well. I don't, it kind of. Maybe it didn't, but I loved it. Yeah. It I'm going to go good. watch it now. I, uh. He was a crush of mine back in the day. So Who, Travis? Uh yeah, not not Travis Kalanick did not like him, but the actor, Joseph Gordon Levin. He was Oh, he was oh yeah. He plays yeah. he plays the Travis. It, it's all done like it's the character is called Travis yeah. Kalanick or Kalanick. It's right? actually about Uber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, Joseph Gordon Levin's a cool guy. He's an interesting actor, isn't he? Yeah, Do you know him? No, no, no. But I mean, I know I who he say, is. Like, can you hook it up for me if my yeah. husband and I? And I oddly enough, I, I did meet him once, but it's you like a, okay. it was at a big conference and I was one of the little speakers. And then he was the big name guy that they have because, you know, he's really into tech. You know, he has a startup and stuff. I and, didn't uh, know that. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very I'll tech savvy. And yeah. so he was he was like the big famous speaker that was going to be there and the rest of us were all little schlubs and <laughs> the CEO who ran the company was like, well, part of the perk is you're going to, we're going to have a VIP meet and greet with Rub elbows. So you all get to shake hands and go like, Hey, uh, I really like it. Yeah. Good looking work. Yeah. Like, what do you say? Right? What do you say? Like just, uh, you're, I've seen you on TV, you know, like, oh, yeah, I don't know what to say. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, but then I started paying attention. Yeah. I think he's a good actor and he, he, he yeah. gets interesting yeah. roles. Yeah. You know, He's, He's uh, yeah. I would say, but he so was great. So he was your yeah. love. He was your crush. He was your twin I mean, plan. of them. Um, a real full circle moment for me was watching uh, Casper. Do you remember that that flick, Casper, with a friendly ghost? Um, it was about yeah. Casper the friendly ghost. There was a, a film back yeah. in. I mean, I guess it must have been the nineties. Um, oh, but I that. watched it with my children, and at the end. Uh, and you probably don't know who this is, but for any of the geriatric millennials listening to the show, you may, especially if you're female, know who this is. But at the end of Casper, Casper the ghost becomes a boy. And the boy who portrays Casper in this is none other than the crush for every single girl in the 90s, Devin Sawa. And I don't know what Devin Sawa is doing now, but he was it back in the 90s. And my own daughter saw Devin saw on screen and later said, mommy, I have a crush on that guy. And I was like, this is too much. This is too really? much. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know who that is, but. It's okay, Dan. It's okay. So, uh, anyway, but, so anyway. maybe he was my long lost twin flame. Who knows? But um, could be. <laughs> he could be. But I think what I want to leave people with is the hope, the ray of hope that you ended Lab Rats with and you're ending this interview with, which is. There is a place for you in the tech industry, no matter how old we get, even if our hair turns gray, like you can find your twin flame employer and have a great career. I mean, you literally use the word psyched to describe how you feel getting up and going to work. For me, that is inconceivable. So I'm just really thrilled that that is possible. So thank you for, for making me aware that it's really, <laughs> maybe it's me, Dan, maybe I am doing something like, oh, you know. <laughs> Get some counseling. Yeah. No, no, the thing of it is, it's hard. Like, you know, yeah, it's, I don't know. Yeah. I think I got lucky. I just got really, really lucky in this. Yeah. I, I stumbled into it, but uh, then I, yeah. I got, you went through it first, Dan. I mean, you, you did have some trauma prior, so yeah. I'm glad you arrived. And, and to be honest, maybe part of the reason like that I think this is going well, or at least it, I learned a lot in about uh, mistakes 
about myself. Like that, that's the other thing about that book is sort of making fun of tech, but it's also really making fun of myself. It's like I did a lot of stupid thing. stuff. Like I had a lot of, yeah, I, yeah, I know. But like, so I learned a lot, I think it made a lot of mistakes, but yeah, I mean, that's part of growing up. Right. And we're uh, going to get you a job. We're going to get you a job. That right? sounds great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm also hoping it might just be this and somehow it'll work out, but podcasting. You. Podcast. Yeah. I mean, apparently there's tons of money in podcasting. Just ask Joe Rogan. I'm I'm sure that's just next for me. Right? I know, right? Easy. Um, I thought. I think it would be. Yeah, some people really make a killing at it. Some people. I think it's like the point zero 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 one percent of people. Kind of like the people who get rich at tech startups with their options. It's like the point zero 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 one. But anyway, um, no, we will we will figure out the good places in tech. Actually, that's one of the missions of this emphasis and and this podcast itself is to highlight employers who are great and do employ people for a long, wonderful, fulfilling career and, you know, provide opportunities for growth, even if you happen to be, you know, over 40. Um, So we'll want to highlight that. So, you know, DocuSign is getting a nice little call out here for being just that. Um, But, you know, the other thing is you mentioned you've learned a lot over the course of your tech career and you've you've done some things right. You've done some things wrong. You've landed where you have. And, you know, I think all of that somewhat sounds like it culminated in your latest book. Um, Shut the F up. Um, sorry, mom. Uh, but it's it's a book all about the the fact that we we talk too much sometimes. And, and I love that I'm discussing this on a podcast. But I think when we next have you back, Dan, I think we we'll should talk, talk about that. the 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 lessons that you can learn from that particular book and how to apply them to your tech career to, to have a longer and better, more fulfilling career in this industry. So that'll yeah, be nice. I'd like that. It does apply to work and to personal yeah. life, but yeah, yeah, that'd be great. For sure. For sure. Well, I think you have uh, shared so much wonderful stuff with us today and I'm so appreciative that you came on the show. Like I said, this was like a big, a big win for me. I've, I've always admired your work and, uh, Really, really thrilled to have you here. So thank you for joining. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's fun to talk about this stuff with you. 